Hi, welcome to a very special edition of Beyond Politics. I'm Katherine Clark. Governor General David Johnson and his wife, Her Excellency Sharon Johnson, are an outgoing, self-effacing couple who are extremely dedicated to their new roles. Married for almost 50 years, they've managed to balance busy, demanding careers with the raising of five accomplished daughters. They are now the proud grandparents of seven grandchildren. And for the first time ever in television, they join me for an exclusive interview to discuss their new adventure. Your Excellencies, welcome to Beyond Politics. It is an absolute delight to have the opportunity to chat with both of you. Thank you. We're Thanks. delighted. Thanks for inviting us. Well, and I understand that you don't often give interviews. No, I don't. This is my third, ever. <laughs> really? Yeah. Why not? Is, do you have a personal aversion to them? No, or? no. I just, uh, I haven't been in a situation. The things I did didn't require interviews, okay. television interviews. Sure. I might have to stand up and talk but not an interview, it's different. The television now, camera's quite foreboding. Well, and, and you're in this entirely different life now where mm -hmm. you're surrounded by people and cameras and um, journalists who are interested in hearing what you have to say. Has that been a real adjustment for both of you? I'm sorry. Well, I, I, don't, I don't think for David. I think he's uh, quite used to this. He's done the uh, editors and public affairs uh, programs. Right. For me, it's quite a change, and you just learn to ignore it as I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> the camera That's ladies. perfect. <laughs> now, Your oh. Excellency, have you become accustomed to being called Your Excellency? No. no. Do you like it? To be honest, not particularly. But to, it's of course a part of the right. position and, and one does what one does and that's fine. We have some fun when people said, we know what we call you, what do we call your wife? I said, well, she's Her Excellency, too. And they would say, well, that'll take some getting used to. I said, no, I've been calling her that for 46 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the other things that struck me was just that um, here you are, private people. You have a private residence here in Rideau Hall, but it's in a public building. This is still a public building. Has that taken uh, some adjustment as well? I think probably more for Sharon than for me, but... In our previous lives, we yes. have been in, um, I was a university president for 26 years, right. so one does have some occasion of your life being a little bit under the microscope, of not course. to the extent of this, but that's something that one just adjusts to, I think. And from my perspective, um, I have a horse farm, and all of the boarders use our house, use our farmhouse for all of their parties. Um, they're in the house, sometimes they have to shower. So I'm not uncomfortable with people coming and going and so on, and even the public. I love it. Sometimes if they're giving a tour, I go too. What do they do? What, what did the members of the public do when suddenly they realized that? Well, sometimes they know and sometimes they don't, but right. usually they get me to take them somewhere they might, might not know, like the, like the chapel. <laughs> yes. Yes, I have to say, before the interview, um, your wife very kindly suggested that I visit the chapel. Wonderful. And I thought perhaps there was something she wasn't telling me, and I... She thought I should pray before our interview. But. That's helpful. <laughs> but no, it's for all parties. <laughs> That's right. But I, I really, I, I think that um, it's probably extremely helpful for both of you that you have had these public elements to your private lives yes. before, a because mm -hmm. it isn't such a, an immense shock to all of a sudden. And also for our children, I think. Right. Uh, we have five daughters, seven grandchildren, and during our. Our university days when our children were still small, they were very active in our public involvement. We would have many dinners in our home and our daughters uh, very typically served and had a great deal of fun with the guests with many stories we could tell about that interaction. Oh, that's exceptional. Mm -hmm. Can you do things with your grandkids here? Can you bake cookies? Can you... Um... We could. We could use the kitchen in any way. Um, they really have made the children um, very, very welcome. And of course, they run up and down the halls and so on. But the story that I'd like to tell is that on a Saturday night after the installation, which was Friday, the uh, formal table, the formal dining room table, was covered with um, booster seats and high chairs, and they were from somewhere from nine months till about ten years of age. And it was, it was just all the length of it, children and, and happy parents. And within 24 hours, we, we entertained all the lieutenant governors, and the pantry staff were able to change over, take away the booster seats and so on. But if you go in the pantry now, you're going to find all those booster seats. It's amazing. That's why I show people this is like a real home. Go just, in the pantry and you'll see. Just outside this room where we're doing this interview, Catherine, is a long hall. 
We have our eight-year-old and four-year-old granddaughters with us, uh, numbers one and number two, because our first daughter's in Mexico lecturing, actually, on administration of the criminal justice for some days. And uh, about this time yesterday when she came home from school, she did cartwheels all the way down the hall. And it's about 60 yards long. That was a pretty good stretch of cartwheels. Oh, it's a, it's it was a impressive. perfect haul for that. <laughs> and you know, it, that's, that's fascinating to me. Um, here you are with all of these public responsibilities and events every day, and yet you're still babysitting your grandchildren. Yep. Oh, that's they're a joy. Up, they'll be here by four. They yeah. will, eh? Yeah. Isn't that how, something? How lucky we are. You know, well, that's exceptional. Yeah. That really is. We have a the Governor General's Literary Awards tonight, and I'll be telling a Grandpa Book story. Our grandchildren call me Grandpa Book because I love to read books to them and love books and how appropriate for the 14 literary awards that will be presented tonight. That's exceptional. Mm -hmm. What do they call you, Your Excellency? I'm Granny Sunrise because I get up early. Is that right? That's right. I'm <laughs> Granny Sunrise. So, Typically so when they, they, sunrise. You, have, you have these small babies, so when they had their small babies, I was getting up to do the morning feed, so I'm Granny Sunrise. Well, I was going to ask if um, you became a morning person uh, after having five children or whether you have always been a morning person. I, it's my biorhythms are such that I have to get up. I can't sleep in. It's just impossible. David would sleep in, but he's never yeah. able to sleep in. So there we have it, two different biorhythms. But uh, <laughs> there's nothing like getting up early and having time to yourself, even when you have children. You must know uh, yeah. that yourself. Well, too. you know, when it actually, um, I try very hard never to set alarm clocks because if we actually make it past 6:30, it's such a wonderful That's day. Right. That's right. Small children. <laughs> yes. But Jane would rise early, and, and she writes and do her writing right. in the morning and do very good writing before the rest of the world was rising. Well, this should be doing her pajamas, time. which is perfect. Yes, most comfortable. But, yeah. But I was just going to go back to your thing about the house. Our house has been an ex it, it has been sort of an extension of our professional life. So the farmhouse, people used it um, for very large events, 100, 200 people, and it would be really nicely turned out. So we used the farmhouse to make good relationships. And similarly, David was just touching on this, but we really used our kids. And now these are bright, they're, they're like yourself, they're very, very bright young people with interesting things they're doing in life. So they become part of this sort of success package. You know, you, you take everything that you've got and you, and you throw it at uh, where you want to go. I think the lesson that we draw from that, Catherine, is um, for children to be comfortable in the lives that their parents are leading, especially if they're a little bit unusual or could otherwise be stressful, um, that when they become part of that, uh, it becomes part of them and it's routine. And normal. Yep. It just becomes what life is. Sure. And in fact, one of the other things about that is that it, it also um, inevitably affects what your children do with their mm -hmm. own lives mm -hmm. because they have been exposed to something that's a little bit different. Right. And one of the things, um, to, to jump forward a bit, but one of the things that has really impressed me about your daughters is just how successful uh, personally and professionally they are, how accomplished and um, how very committed to you as parents they are. And I wondered if that's simply because they have such exceptional role models in both of you or did you give them guidance? Did you, I mean, were there words of wisdoms or mottos that your family lived by that shaped them into who they are today? I think we kind of let them loose, quite <laughs> frankly. Um, I say not in jest that all the important things in life I've learned from my children. Uh, for me, it's been a real education raising children. And here I am, having been in a university all my life. Uh, people would say I've never had a real job. The university was so good, I never left it. And this is my first job outside the university, and it's in public service. All five of our daughters are in public service, so I've simply followed my children. And I don't think we have directed them into public service positions, but my guess is just through the atmosphere of our household and the kinds of things that they were involved in, in and around that household, I think they came to have a great appreciation for public service and the idealism of public service, of wanting to serve others and serve their country in one way or another. They would meet people like your dad, interesting people, just as you were growing up. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you were meeting these interesting people and you get inspired by them. But I wanted to say one thing, we mustn't forget my mother because she was a yes. single social worker. Um, Who went back to get her degree at, after well, becoming... Well, yes, she was a nurse, Royal Victoria yeah. nurse, but at 50 she did her master's of right. social work. But she was right at the forefront of rehabilitation medicine and was given one of the first projects in this uh, particular area where she took 10 women, all in the dole, and only one didn't succeed to become an independently su a per person supporting her children. So all our kids spent their summers with her. They went up with Granny, this uh, Granny, 
and they had all sorts of names, Dooner and Frizzy and all sorts of things, but she was a remarkably smart, bright, informed person um, who could get into a good political argument. I think that's... So, so she, she was an inspiration, too. I think that's a direct connection to our children, her grandchildren. They were greatly influenced by their granny, whom they loved. She was the first social worker in our part of northern Ontario. We grew up in Sault Ste. Marie, and much of her life was spent in bush planes, bush planes flying into very difficult places. And her mother, Sharon's grandmother, um, also lived with them until Sharon was 19 or 20 when she passed away. She also was a single mom who had raised Sharon's mom, extraordinary woman, the first lady superintendent of the Galt Hospital in Lethbridge. And these, uh, these women of, of courage um, and capacity to do difficult things uh, with some degree of ease and prepare themselves, I think, have been lessons that have been transferred so here's to our the children. expression. There wasn't a man worth a damn until David came along. <laughs> <laughs> and we're not sure about him. <laughs> well, I actually understand now, that that mustn't be repeated, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not at all, off the record. Um, oh. I understand, I mean, you, you were obviously very close to your mother. Yes, very. And... Uh, as was I. Yes, and I was going to say you were to you both, were yeah. very influenced by her, and, and she was very important to you. Sure. And that, in fact, is not normally right. necessarily the relationship right. that one has with one's right. mother-in-law. One um, appreciates, um, accepts, uh, but not necessarily love deeply. Yeah. And what was it about her that you loved deeply? Uh, she was just an extraordinary human being, as was uh, her mother. And both of them loved me. Mm. Uh, uh, Sharon's grandmother. Oh, they really her. did. I didn't have a choice. <laughs> oh, it was in the cards. <laughs> well, I was her first date when she was 13 in high school. You'd, I guess you'd have to say it was an arranged marriage with uh, her mother and grandmother in the, in the bleachers. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, they were, I guess I loved them because they were Sharon's mom and grandmom, first of all. But they were just extraordinary people. They were pioneers. Uh, they uh, had all the grace that you'd expect of a, of a, of a wonderful lady, but they, uh, they were tenacious, uh, inventive, um, creative, um, and did whatever was necessary to get the job done. Did they boss you around? Oh, no. heavens no. no. Oh, no, my grandmother, yes, yeah, she bossed she everybody boss, around. Yes. My mother didn't boss anyone. And no one? It wasn't. It wasn't needed. They, were, they had so much charm over me, all they had to do was whisper and I'd jump. I hope you have the same relationship with your wife. Like Her Excellency for 46 years? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me how you met. Well, well, you, you is start? it the same story? Do you have the same story? Or? Don't tell, yeah, no, no, don't tell about okay. the tow truck there. <laughs> well, he courted me in the tow truck, but uh, that was kind of fun. But uh, that's the only, that was the only I used only to drive vehicle. a tow truck, and that was my means of transportation. If there was a dance, I would be given the tow truck after... The garage closed, and do, there you were. Do you know something that, that is important in, in looking at all of this? We were sort of 50s kids who got into the 60s, and you could go out with all sorts of people and have different dates and so on. And uh, there was a kind of moral code that you could have, you know, go out to a, a pub or something with somebody and then go dancing with somebody else or whatever, because it was a moral code that allowed you to do this. And so we did go out with other people, and that was a really good thing. But we started at 13, and we ended at 21. And in between, we had a whole lot of fun at it's our a, various universities and so on. So it wasn't you like this. Assuming you describe marriage as an end. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that. Well, did you, did you then know that you were hoping to be or planning to be or wanting to be together from the time that you first met? Or was it really a, a friendship that um, by the time you were 21, you realized this person is sure, right for me? Sure, have a different answer to this than I, Catherine, but... I think we were at an age where we tended to date a lot of different people mm -hmm. and not sort of fall madly in love and one would only see that person through our teenage years. And I actually think that's a pretty good thing, that young boys get to get used to young girls and vice versa right. and have a wide variety of friends. And, and both of us, even as teenagers and, and right through our lives, I would have many women whom I describe as girlfriends uh, um, not madly in love with, but really close companions, good, yes. good, good friends. And uh, I think that was true of your life as well. You have a lot of um, friends. And you went around as a group and so on. I mean, it was a really wonderful time. Things didn't go off the rails until the 70s. Yeah. And then things kind of went... And then they went right off the rails. They went off the rails, really <laughs> off the rails. And then fortunately we had our kids later, so they got back on the rails. Quite a conservative group. So you, you really started then back together when you were in your early 20s. Yes, I, I went to the States for yep. university, and Sharon was at Toronto. So we, we didn't see 
one another a lot until uh, I think my third year university. And in fact, um, it was towards the end of that summer and her granny had just passed away and I went to uh, their home to pay respects and uh, to her mother and then here was this girl that I remembered as a pretty nifty gal and uh, I fell in love. And, that was and that. then sent me a rose every day for the next year and then proposed. <laughs> well, aren't you a romantic? That's right. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah, that's a rare, exceptional feature. <laughs> I, I, I did it right for no a period of time. No more roses, no more roses. <laughs> and then we had our first year of marriage in England, uh, which was okay. a, quite an adventure. I was studying at Cambridge. Sharon was finishing physio and occupational therapy, so she did an internship uh, year in England while I was uh, finishing my law degree. And, we were as poor as church mice, and I don't think we've ever lived better in our lives. But you know how much fun that must have it been. Was. Just it the was two of you. Of it was. And you just, you had no one but, but each other. You bet. And you could just really, you were free to do what you wanted yeah. to do. It must have been great. Yeah. Really. And it the Americans, great. I remember at Cambridge, used to always speak Old English, Chaucerian English. Oh. <laughs> I mean, it was really a heady group. Okay. And we had a dining room that nobody, once everybody was there for American Thanksgiving, nobody could get in unless they climbed in the window. In the window, over the table. Marvelous. That's fun. <laughs> many stories. You do that in your 20s. I'd heard that you had bronchitis on your first date. Is that? Uh... Yes, that. How did you find that out? <laughs> I did. And so David Johnston came, and instead of trying to kiss me in the corner, he tutored me in French. <laughs> Just because you didn't, didn't want to get sick? He didn't ask another girl, no. That's... <laughs> How did you find that out? Oh, well, you know, in my oh, job, well. I'm, I'm paid to, to figure that, out well, the little things. Well, that is things. the truth. That's right. <laughs> that must have been a pretty good lesson, because her French is better than mine today. Is it? <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's a passion. Well, or you had bronchitis a lot, one or the other. That's right. <laughs> So um, when you married, did you, did you have a sense that you would, in fact, have a large family, or did that happen? I think we both wanted to, I wanted to have a large family, because I came from a small family, and uh, I really did want a, a large family. I, we both did. I, I think I can answer for both of us, but maybe we looked at it differently, and not so rushy. I mean, five and seven years was a bit fast. So Oh, I, I don't know, actually know how you survived. You're, you're try just trying to cope, yeah. so um, that's when I went back to school. Got yep. a good nanny oh, when oh, back good. to school. That's oh, right. gosh, that's Give music to my ears. Now, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. I'll have my husband watch the show, too. <laughs> Well, oh, and um, how did that affect your life? I mean, to have so many children so quickly, and you're really in the thick of the insanity of, of that time of your life, and you're also still trying to balance professional interests and careers. How did you make it work? For, for me, I had to get my health in order. I mean, I really, I became a dedicated runner, and it was just so important, and I would run 7.6 kilometers every day. I had to work up to that. But that was the really important thing to keep perspective. That's a lot of kids, three in diapers. Mm. So you, you, you develop whatever is necessary to make it fun. And uh, then David's career was, I mean, as we say, we, we pulled all these kids in um, to, to make our, our whole home life fun. Right. And they enjoyed the benefits. So you, how did you feel about this? Well, I think I was delighted to have a large family um, because there's, for us, there's just no joy like it. My children are the most important things in the world to me, and I've had a lot of things that I would regard as important, but nothing compares with that. And when we had five children in seven years, I think, to give credit to our children, they helped to bring one another up. Mm, and we would good. live by the phrase, it takes a village to raise a child. Uh, we had so many members of the village in so many different capacities, all of whom have had a great influence in raising uh, our children. And um, I suppose, like any situations where you're busy, you have to carve out your priorities. I think Sharon did it very well, and, and, and she finished her, her master's degree and her PhD degree in rehabilitation medicine when we were at McGill, a very demanding uh, program, our five uh, daughters, um, and lots of activities going on, so she had to strike priorities. I think in my case, um, one, I suppose you learn to multitask, uh, but two, you, you learn to carve out those quality times and really protect them very, very carefully uh, so that um, your children have you as a first priority and not as a kind of rebound. Are you able to do that in this current job, to carve out that time for your family? Not according to our kids. No, really? They're, they're, they're really asking to know where we are. Where are they now? Because we want to be there. So it, it's actually, it, it's interesting. We used to ch check in where our kids were, but they're actually really asking the people that do programs and so on um, in terms of this mandate, um, 
we want to be where our parents are. We're proud of them. We like to be with them. And, and uh, so we're working that out and people are really responding to this. But uh, I'm sure you felt the same growing up that w when something interesting is happening with your parents, you want to be part of it too. So that's what they're saying. I think the great thing, Catherine, is that uh, our children are asserting their claims for our grandchildren, mm -hmm. for their children. See, Granny and Grandpa. And now, we're relatively new in this new situation, like 55 days or so, and still sorting it out. But I think the good thing is that each of our five daughters um, said, we want some of your time. We spent last weekend in Boston with our fifth daughter, who's just finished her last educational uh, degree, her hurdle, and was married in May and has just moved into a new house. And she pointed out that we have not seen her new house and have not visited her, so we got ourselves down. And, oh, and as you can we expect, moved. We, had, we had a wonderful time. <laughs> Mm. That's, that's excellent. And, and each, each of the other four daughters would be the same in uh, respectively, but respectfully, but persistently indicating um, time for them and their children. One of the things that I was thinking as I was listening to you speak about um, your daughters and their, their, their very strong commitment to your family as a unit um, is, oh, their poor husbands. Because I know that in my case, um, when I married, uh, it was kind of like my husband was marrying three people because we, my parents and I are a very close unit. I'm an only child, but also just the life we led meant that we're very close. Your daughter's husbands must feel very much the same way. I mean, they've, they have joined into a family. They have, they have married a daughter, but they have become part of a very tight unit. Well, and I think that all of them had some understanding of the family before our children were married, which is a very good thing. It wasn't as if... It wasn't uh, a shock. That's right. Yeah, they knew what they were getting into. <laughs> one of them, I think, I was introduced to one of them as John Calvin. Uh, and you can put whatever connotation you want on that. So that's not all bad when you're dealing with suitors to your daughters. <laughs> the, the, our daughters and sons-in-laws really tried to strike, which is your generation too, tried to strike a life balance. And so our sons-in-laws are, are, even though their careers are important, they're all professionals, um, they really are very involved in, in a way that David couldn't be. But our kids had other things that were going on. There were all these interesting people coming and going and so on and so forth. They were in universities and had access. So um, our sons-in-laws, you know, they, they're, they are a different generation, and I think they really enjoy this excitement. They enjoy what David's doing. We, we should it's also speak nice. about mm. the importance of sport in our family. Yes. Uh, oh, both wow. Sharon and I have always been interested in sports and physical fitness, uh, and I suppose that's come naturally to our children as little children, mm. but they have acquired that as well, and all of their husbands are similarly minded people. So, one, we do a lot of family activities together that involve sport, or outdoors activity in some way or another, and did from the time the children were very, very small. I think all our daughters, all five daughters, started skiing when they were two, oh, and now great. our grandchildren are also uh, have started when they were two. That's very early. Yeah. And I grew up. We grew up in northern Ontario, where you learn to skate before you learn to walk. So <laughs> skating's been a big part as well. And summer activities, uh, active runners, that sort of thing. Have, and that has been not only, I think, good from a health point of view, but it's been a kind of uh, common activity for the family and so often our gatherings today would be around uh, a place we have in the country uh, near Ski Mountain and yes. Lake uh, or at the farm where there's lots of external activities. Do you ever miss hockey? Do sure. you, ever, do, you wish, do you wish that you had yep. done that as a career? Yep. You do? Yep. Why didn't you? Uh, there were six teams in the NHL uh, when I graduated in 1963. And uh, I was invited to the Bruins training camp, and I played defense. I have an injured left hand, so I don't handle a stick very well. And I weighed 150 pounds. And if I thought about, if I thought I would have made the team, I would have been there. You would have. Pure and simple. Yeah. Um, when it was five or six years later that the 30 team NHL came along, and uh, probably life would have been a little different from then. But I, I should treat that question with respect. I love the game, but. I love what I did. I went to study law in Cambridge because I thought it was wise to get as far away from uh, college hockey and, that I loved and played and the possibility of doing more in it and uh, have had a, a wonderful career. I love being a lawyer. I love the law. I've been a professor of law all my life. And the beautiful thing about a, a law professor is you got one foot in this magnificent university with the kids are so bright. They're teaching you all the time. And you can research whatever you want. And for me, the reform of the law uh, the concept of justice to inform and prove the law has been very important. So you do that from an intellectual point of view and a learning point of view, and then because you're a professional, you can put it to work. 
you've got your other foot in the real world, and you really can make change. One of the um, things that I noticed about your, your installation ceremony, and one of the reasons why I was so looking forward and hoping to have the chance to interview both of you at the same time, was um, that you have this very um, close, you have a very close relationship. It's evident to anyone who sees you. But you also don't seem to take each other particularly seriously. You take your relationship seriously, mm -hmm. but not each other seriously. How did that develop? Well, the, the way I joke, it's like never having a man worth a damn until David came along. Um, I, I also joke that for 46 years, we have stayed out of one another's hair. This has been a very good marriage because we have our own interests. Now he is working and living in the same place. We're awfully close. The first thing I did was to move my very official office into a, to make it into a conference room for everybody. And I moved myself into Lord Tweedsmere, John Buchan's office, Little Wee Library, to just to separate myself. It, it's really good. We've had our own interests. We have, we have similar things. We have our family. We have sports. Those things bring us together. Um, but uh, I like sports, horses. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I have different interests. David, of course, is interested in history and so on. So, you know, we, we have a nice balance. I've got my eyes on John Buchan's office, all those great <laughs> books there. <laughs> but at the installation, I yes. have to say, we, we looked up and saw young people. We, we decided we would change our guest list, and we said to the kids, we want you to invite two or three couples, your friends. These are five girls, and these are all their friends. People who have impacted your life, and you would be amazed at... Uh, these people who had impacted their lives. They're just so bright, but they also have been amazing friends through difficulties. Young people have difficulties, whatever they are. Um, just being supportive. And mm -hmm. so we just looked up and we saw all these young faces. And it was really inspiring. Why do you do something like this? Why would you come to Rita Hall, and, live in an institution like and this? And part of that comes back to that comment, it takes a village to raise a child. Yeah. And many of those people were part of the villagers who yeah. raised our children, and including the young people who have been their close friends and have been part of their development as young people. You just raised horses, and I want to touch on that because uh, one of the things that we had heard uh, before the installation ceremony was that, in fact, you, Your Excellency, were a little bit reluctant to take on this new challenge, but that you had been swayed through both a private meeting uh, with Prime Minister Harper yeah. and Mrs. Yeah. Harper yeah. and by visiting the RCMP mm -hmm. stables. Why are horses so important to you? Well, this is something I did very late in life, started to ride in my late 50s. So the show name of my horse is Outward Bound. That's as outward bound as you can get. You know, you're just going to be 60 soon, and you're actually on a big animal. Um, but I just had an experience that I'll share with you this week, because the RCMP chap is actually at Windsor, um, organizing the Golden Jubilee. I went out to a place, and um, this gal was so empowering, and she had me cantering all over an open field, and tomorrow she's going to start me jumping. I did a little bit of jumping before, but I felt so good. I'm 67, and to do that and to be you know, galloping around the field, I just felt terrific. And why does this husband look worried? <laughs> no, no, but it's, it's just they're important because, for exercise, mm -hmm. of course, but they're also important because it's very empowering to think you can do that. You know, aging, you can't stop it, but you can do something with it. Keep the jumps to four feet or less, yeah. too. <laughs> they might be just six inches, but still. Are you glad that you've taken on this challenge? Well, I'm thrilled. Yeah. What a wonderful opportunity to serve Canada, which we love. Your Excellency? Absolutely. I'm so grateful to both of you for taking the time today. It's just been an, a true pleasure. Thank you very much. What a pleasure for Thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much. operation.